And so uh, moving on here with uh, Beowulf's fight with Grendel, uh, we continue. Um, he was eager, uh, Grendel was eager to escape to his lair, seek the company of devils, but he was restrained as never before. So he's going to go back to his lair to seek the company of devils. Um, remember that Beowulf is being compared here to Christ, and that uh, in a certain respect, and that Christ was, uh, in addition to Thor, on, on the Scandinavian plane, or the, the sign regime of the Scandinavian uh, mythos, he's compared to Thor and Thor's deeds of ridding the earth of giants. Thor is a Scandinavian immune cell, a sort of um, defender of the Scandinavian disc of the earth against the giants who infected, as though the earth were to be imagined as a gigantic cell with a membrane around it in the form of the Midgard wall that surrounds it, and giants get in over that wall. They're like antigens uh, or viruses or bacteria that get in and penetrate the world uh, that is represented by the Scandinavian earth disk Midgard, and Thor is the immune system who functions to rid the world of giants. Um, the comparison with Christ, on the other hand, is that uh, Christ was, recall, a kind of exorcist. He receives from John the Baptist during the baptism of John. Uh, sort of one of the side effects of the baptism is receiving the power to perform exorcisms. He drives out demons, swarms of demons from uh, herds of swine, for instance, uh, and he goes around healing people and performing exorcisms. It was thought in Mesopotamian tradition that when a person got sick, you weren't just sick, but you were actually turned upside down and held by uh, a demon who holds one of your feet upside down so that you were actually thought to be uh, possessed by a demon so that possession and sickness and health were intimately intertwined. If you were sick, you, chances are uh, you were possessed by a devil. And so Christ was the master of driving out demons and cleansing. In, in a certain respect here, Beowulf is drawing from two mythic figures from two different sign regimes He's smelted together both Thor on the one hand as an ant, as a uh, as an immune uh, system and Christ on the other as a performer of exorcisms. So in cleansing the hall of Herat uh, and driving Grendel out, he is also cleansing the world. He is cleansing Valhalla so that it can exist in a separation back into the world of light where it belongs from the realm of darkness so that that world of hell, H-E-L, can be uh, exist on a, in a separate sense from Valhalla. Um, then who you lacks brave kinsman bore in mind his boast. He rose from the bed and gripped Grendel fiercely. The fiend tried to break free. His fingers were bursting. Beowulf kept with him. The evil giant was desperate to escape, if indeed he could, and head for his lair in the fens. He could feel his fingers cracking in his adversary's grip. That was a bitter journey that Grendel made to the ring hall Herat. The great room boomed all the proud warriors. Each and every Dane living in the stronghold were stricken with panic. And notice that none of the warriors comes to Beowulf's aid. None of them come to help him, which there again, uh, they're not helping him may also be uh, an atavism from when it was just Beowulf and two other companions by himself who were the ones performing this uh, monster slaying deed. Uh, the two hall were, there's also the fact too that as Tolkien mentions that um, it's possible that Beowulf, Beowulf is fighting without armor and without weapons against Grendel uh, and it's possible that that uh, tradition of him fighting without weapons and it happens one other time when he slays Huyalax, the man who kills Huyalax, Direfin, whose name means Day Raven, uh, but who is slain uh, by, by Beowulf who grabs him in a bear hug and slays him, that it may be a holdover from uh, Beowulf's association with a bear, uh, which also, in a sense, fights without weapons. Uh, so that is a possibility. Uh, Tolkien also thought that Beowulf's swimming motifs uh, seem to ally him closer with some uh, type of swimming creature, uh, a fish-like creature, perhaps. It can't be a polar bear, he says, because the Vikings did not discover or encounter polar bears until they went to Iceland in 900 AD, so that would be too late for there to be an association with a polar bear. Uh, but I suspect, however, that Beowulf was probably originally uh, uh, a pr a associated with bears and was a production uh, from uh, an inland dwelling people that migrated to the shores. Often what will happen is that a people that is living inland or is has come from elsewhere and comes to a, a shore way of life, a, a seaworthy way of life, as the Greeks did, for, exa for example, descended from the Indo-Aryans and they brought the god Poseidon with them whose name Poseidas 
means Lord of the Earth. And so we know that he was originally a Stonic deity. He was associated with the Earth. He was the Lord of the Earth, not the ocean. Um, he was a thunder hurling deity whose thunderbolt was retranslated into a trident when he, a fish hook, when he became associated with the ocean. Uh, in somewhat the same manner, the god Uranos, whose name means the starry heaven, uh, becomes Varuna. Varuna is the same name as Uranos in uh, Hindu or Vedic mythology, and he was originally uh, associated with the stars, but then he got retranslated also to uh, a sea god. Varuna becomes a, a, the god of the god of the ocean. And so perhaps it was the case that Beowulf was associated with a forest-dwelling people. Perhaps he, the bear nature actually is an astronomical reflection of Ursa Major. That's another possibility. And that this people migrated, uh, as we know, the Yats did live along the shores of the southern tip of Sweden. Uh, and at that point, he may have been recoded and re-territorialized as a swimming creature, as a creature who's constantly winning. He's winning swimming battles. He wins the, the swimming battle against Brekka later on after the events of Beowulf have taken place. Uh, and he joins the campaign of Huyalak going up the Rhine uh, in his ill-fated expedition against the Frisians. Um, he has to end up swimming his way back. So he is associated with mighty swimming feats. Um, so perhaps a bear, uh, perhaps some sort of fish creature. Um, there's a lot of becoming animal motifs in Beowulf. This is really a, uh, the mythology of, of a hunting people, of people who have made their primary living doing hunting. As Tacitus describes in his Germania, uh, which is the earliest text that we have, dating from about 60 AD or so, uh, of the German peoples, uh, they weren't much for agriculture, uh, according to uh, the uh, to Tacitus. I think hunting was their primary thing. It was a wonder the wine hall withstood two so fierce in battle that the fair building did not fall to earth, but it stood firm, braced inside and out with hammered iron bands. I have heard tell that there, where they fought, many a mead bench studded with gold started from the floor. So they're til tipping over mead benches, and notice that that upending of mead benches uh, links back to the opening lines of the poem, when one of the epithets of Schild Scheffing was described as uh, an overturner of mead benches. Schild Scheffing often deprived his enemies, many tribes of men, of their mead benches. And here they are doing just that, uh, tipping over the mead benches in this fight. And so that reference foreshadows this fight. Until that time, elders of the Schildings were of the opinion that no man could wreck the Great Hall Herod, adorned with horns, and there again, there are the, the antlers horns of the reindeer or the stag that uh, is uh, in Scandinavian myth associated with bringing up from the underworld the sun. Um, nor by any means destroy it unless it were gutted by greedy tongues of flame, which of course it is eventually burned down uh, just as the cosmos is consumed during Ragnarok. Again and again, clang and clatter shattered the night's silence. Dread numbed the North Danes, seized all who heard the shrieking from the wall, the enemy of God's grisly lay of terror, his song of defeat, heard Hell's captive keening over his wound. Beowulf held him fast, he who was the strongest of all men ever to have seen the light of life on earth. By no means did the defender of Thanes allow the murderous collar to escape with his life. He reckoned that the rest of Grendel's days were useless to anyone. Then time and again Beowulf's band brandished their ancestral swords, they longed to save the life, if they so could, of their lord, the mighty leader. When they did battle on Beowulf's behalf, struck at the monster from every side, eager for his end, those courageous warriors were unaware that no war sword, not even the finest iron on earth, could wound their evil enemy, for he had woven a secret spell against every kind of weapon, every battle blade. So Grendel is, imper Grendel is impervious to uh, any kind of human-made blade, uh, as is his mother, uh, and so that is the reason why Beowulf is able to kill the mother only with a sword that he finds hanging from her wall that has been manufactured by giants. Uh, so they cannot, neither the mother nor the son can be killed with any human made weapon. Um, and it just so happens that Beowulf uh, is the one who shows up with the innovation of trying to fight Grendel uh, barehanded. He does it as a boast uh, to make the battlefield, the playing field equal. But it turns out to be just the right, uh, just the right thing to do. Grendel's death, his departure from this world, was destined to be wretched. His migrating spirit was fated to travel far into the power of fiends. <clears throat> then he who for years had committed crimes against mankind, murderous in mind, and had warred with God, 
discovered that the strength of his body could not save him, that Huyalak's brave kinsmen held his hand in a vice-like grip. Each was a mortal enemy to the other. The horrible monster suffered grievous pain. A gaping wound opened on his shoulder. The sinews sprang apart. The muscles were bursting. Glory in battle was given to Beowulf. Fatally wounded, Grendel was obliged to make for the marshes, head for his joyless lair. He was well aware that his life's days were done, come to an end. After that deadly encounter, the desire of every Dane was at last accomplished. Uh, and so Beowulf has now finally rid the hall of its, uh, of its infection. In this way did the wise and fearless man, who had traveled from far, cleanse Hrothgar's hall, release it from affliction. He rejoiced in his night's work, his glorious achievement. Notice that this, all, that this battle has all taken place at night. Uh, again, the motif of the sun in the underworld fighting uh, underworld demons, and then with the dawn, just as the sun chases the constellations away, and one of the constellations was indeed a giant, Orion. Uh, the huntsman is typically regarded as a giant. The Egyptians called him the giant. Um, so the sun comes in and chases away the constellations of the night, just as Beowulf, the solar hero, comes in and chases away these uh, giants from another age. They're hold atavistic holdovers from the age uh, from before the flood, the Noachian flood. The leader of the Yats made good his boast to the East Danes. He had removed the cause of their distress, put an end to the sorrow every Dane had shared, the bitter grief that they had been constrained to suffer. When Beowulf, brave in battle, placed hand, arm, and shoulder, Grendel's entire grasp under Herod's spacious roof, that was evidence enough of victory. Uh, and then the text begins here with the second day. Uh, then I have heard that next morning many warriors gathered round the gift hall. So as the sun has arisen, the warriors come filing in, as they normally do each morning. They take, retake possession of the hall in the morning as the constellations are gone. The monsters from the night are gone and the sun of consciousness has arisen. They come in and they discover Grendel's arm hanging from the rafters. Um, and so uh, this is the second day. This is the day then that would correspond to Christ's harrowing of hell. When Christ, after he's crucified, uh, descends down into the underworld to harrow hell and bring up the patriarchs. Um, so on this day, Beowulf will do battle with Grendel's mother uh, by descending down into her underworld, paying her a visit in her hall. That's a mirror image, just as Grendel has paid uh, Hrothgar a visit to his hall and been a very rude occupant of that hall. So Beowulf will now repay in kind by going to pay uh, Grendel's mother or uh, Grendel's mother a visit in her hall, which is a cave underneath a lake in an underworld habitation, and he will be a, a very rude visitor to that hall as well. Leaders of men came from every region, <clears throat> from remote parts, to look on the wonder, the tracks of the monster. Grendel's death seemed no grievous loss to any of the men who set eyes on the spore of the defeated one, saw how he, weary in spirit, overcome in combat, faded and put to flight, had made for the lake of water demons, leaving tracks of life blood. So they follow his tracks back to the swamp, to the mere uh, that he has come from. Then the water boiled because of the blood, the fearful swirling waves reared up, mingled with hot blood, battle gore, faded, he hid himself, then joyless laid aside his life, his heathen spirit in the fen lair. Hell received him there. So he dies, he doesn't go to Valhalla, of course, he goes down to hell, to the region of the underworld, uh, in his death. After this, the old retainers left the lake, and, uh, and so did the company of young men too, Brave warriors rode back on their gleaming horses from this joyful journey. Then Beowulf's exploit was acclaimed. Many a man asserted time and again that there was no better shield-bearer in the whole world. Beowulf, note, is a shield-bearer, just as the uh, ancestor, the eponymous founder of the Shieldings, Shield Sheffing, had come to provide the Danes with a shield, so Beowulf comes across the water to provide, uh, to provide Hrothgar uh, with a shield against Grendel in the whole world to north or south between the two seas under the sky's expanse, no man more worthy of his own kingdom. Yet they found no fault at all with their friendly lord, gracious Hrothgar. He was a great king, uh, as it was said of Shield Sheffing, that that was a good king, and so Hrothgar too uh, is a good king, is a great king. Uh, and it's no blight on him that he has not been able to successfully deal with Grendel. However, I think there, that the poet has uh, brought in a motif in the story that the sovereign classes have failed. The ruling classes have failed in their job of governing and have had to resort to the warrior classes to come in and straighten the situation out. We'll continue uh, on the next uh, video here.